libertarians are so deeply into their, you know, mutually beneficial exchanges and um, their free trade. And this is just another free trade relationship. I The True Objective Podcast with Objectivist Girls Lauren Rockler and SidekickApp.com's Orion Martin. The True Objective Podcast dispelling myths about our society. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the True Objective Podcast. So you will notice that Orion is not with me, but guess what? All you excited fans of Orion Martin and his sidekick app, he will be on next show, and I am so excited because we have a really cool new series. But we also have a really cool episode for tonight. Tonight we are talking about kink, and we are talking about how people in the lifestyle live the lifestyle and do all sorts of interesting things within the lifestyle but mostly we're talking about a lot of the different psychological aspects of it so let's get kinky um, so we'll start with my first guest Leslie Leslie was on my last show say hi Leslie hi so Leslie is um, well versed in the BDSM lifestyle. She knows plenty about it. And um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your involvement, Leslie? Um, I have been involved in BDSM since I legally could be. So I have explored many different power roles and exchanges throughout my time in the BDSM scene. And I feel pretty well versed to speak on all of them that I've tried. Perfect, perfect. And um, so I wanted to ask you what BDSM means to you. Um, what BDSM means to me, it's, it's the way of exploring different power exchanges within a relationship, which to me allows me to work through past traumas throughout my life and any sort of mental health issue that I have going on I can use BDSM to explore and I think that's very meaningful for me yeah um, that sounds really meaningful um, I think that BDSM is a good way for people to kind of experience all the different spices of life um, and we'll get into the difference between BDSM and abuse but also I want to ask my guest Emily hi Emily say hi first of all <laughs> hello and do you want to tell us a little bit about your involvement in the BDSM world um, as well as um, I have been involved as nearly as well actually Kind of longer than what I legally could be, um, but actually, <laughs> yeah. But but um, it's uh, it's been a part of who I am for a very long time. Um, I am not I, I'm not currently active in any like scene. I don't um, I don't do it outside of my 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 set romantic relationships currently. I have. Um, I have had many different roles. Each person that I'm with is a different role, just as in any relationship. Um, for me, BDSM is very much a way to, to express myself to um, sanely and safely enjoy things that otherwise would not be either of those things. And um, it is very much a way of uh, expressing, a yeah, a therapy for me. Like, um, like it's a way of, you know, expressing things and getting frustrations out, and and, and um, it also is a way of getting dopamine and those kind of things that come along with yeah 
And I yeah. think that's a really good explanation for what BDSM is. Um, is there anything you want to add to like what BDSM means to you? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm a very logical person, so BDSM means, you know, bondage, dominant, you know, and the state of masochism part. Um, for me, it means a community and a safe place and, and safe people to, and, it, and it's not always, and that's something that, you know, we'll talk about, but to, to be able to have those things and those desires in a safe manner and yeah. a consent, consented manner. Yeah, and, and Matt, Matt is my last guest, and I am so excited to have him on. He knows a lot about the scene and is very open about um, his involvement in it, so say hi, Matt. Well, um, can't get Matt on the line just yet, but hopefully we will. Um, so, ladies, first of all, um, what are the psychological aspects do you think that are involved in being a part of the BDSM world? Like, what comes to mind when you think of psychological aspects of the BDSM world? Um, Leslie, why don't we start with you? Well, to start, we can look at the very obvious, which is the domination and the submission aspect of the BDSM world. Both mm -hmm. of those are very structured psychological places that you have to be in in order to partake. Mm -hmm. in that particular kink. Um, there's also this the power exchange outside of the be outside of the domination and submission, which for just either a top or a bottom is still very psychological. And I could go on, but I'd start rambling. <laughs> It's okay. Um, and Emily, wh what do you think? Um, what's kind of the psychological aspect that's really involved in being a part of the BDSM scene? Um, I, I mean, it is... I, I have noticed throughout my play that I'm not... I think when we use the term psychological aspect, we automatically think that everybody in the scene has depression or has anxiety or, you know, all these things. And the, the more I, the more I have played, the more I have find I found out, the it's not nearly as much, but it very much is. Um, there, we as humans, we have our a need for community and a need for the, you know, and we, the way our brain works, you know, there's so many different wirings and so many different, you know, and the, the psychological part of BDSM is the community part. There are people, it's, there's people that are disgusted by simply foot fetishes, which, you know, there's nothing that's actually very brain wired from birth fetish because the wiring is so close in your brain that everything is connected and wires cross. We know this now. And there's that sense of need for community and for people who understand, you know, there's, you know, I, that, that was my big thing. I have a lot of things that I enjoy that are not a run of the mill and, you know, finding that connection and finding that therapy, finding the, you know, the right people to the the right tops, the right bottoms, the right the right moderate mediator, mediator I can't even talk. Moderator. <laughs> <the> right. <laughs> yeah. I mean I mean there are things like protectors in the community there. That's yeah, that they're that word. <laughs> yeah. Protectors are uh, uh, I've come across in, in my my research of the scene, um, I have seen many different roles in many different aspects. And um, and but first, I want to touch on kind of what I see as kind of the psychological aspect of it. A lot of people have a really negative tone about kink and about BDSM um, because they assume because people are hitting people that either they both have something wrong with them or you know there's some kind of back. Um, 
background trauma um, in their life. And yeah, I, that's what I was saying. Like, you know, like we're like we're all fucked up somehow. I mean, we are, but you know, like we're no different than the general population. I think it's true yeah. to some extent, but overall, um, I think that the people in the community are uh, normal people that are interested. I know there are some people that have some background trauma, but ultimately, I think that it's um, been an experience of community from the research that I've done and everybody feels very close and very safe and that safety adds to the experience, it doesn't take away from it and if people were really as messed up as people say that they are in the community then it wouldn't be an experience of comfort, it would be they wouldn't enjoy that experience of comfort, they would search for an experience of trauma. Um, so the next thing I really want to go into is the roles and um, and so I think it's important that people understand what the roles are in the community because people think based on Fifty Shades of Grey that there's really only the dominant and submissive side. And first we should probably cover what do we think of Fifty Shades of Grey, Leslie? Uh, <laughs> Let Emily do the cons and I'm going to do the pro. Okay, Emily, you go ahead and do the cons. The cons. Um, it's abuse. It is plain out, flat out abuse, and it is glamorizing an abusive relationship. Um, these are people yeah, that forthright with her from the beginning. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I. There, it. These people needed psychiatrists' help, medical help, not hitting each other. Um, that that's something too. There's that fine line between. But using BDSM for therapy and needing actual therapy, um, the writing is horrible. Oh, so horrible! Uh, My, yeah. This morning I had kinkier sex than most of the sex in that book. Those shows. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and yeah, great. My partners are gonna listen to that. And <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, it's okay. Uh, they love uh, you. Well. Yeah, well, I mean, at least one of them was part of it. Um, <laughs> there is, it is very um, non-consensual ownership based. And as a anarchist and a libertarian, I, there, although they did do, oh, see, I can't, I can't say because you're going to do the, the pros. They did one good thing that they yes. mentioned that, you know, most people don't do that needs to be in every relationship, but... What, um, you do your pro. Um, contracts. Contracts, 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 contracts. Every freaking relationship you're in needs to be contracted, um, especially in BDSM, but also in, you know, the poly world and business world. Um, and even the monogamous world, marriage is a contract. So that is the one thing they did right. Contract, 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 and negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. If you don't want to do it, and she has her hard limits, and she does not go past her hard limits, that is the that is one good thing about that book is they brought that up and because that is never really so important. He never really pressures her to go past her hard limits. So mm -hmm. that was another aspect of the book that I did appreciate. Um, it was very frustrating for me. Um, to kind of see such a simple relationship as needing a contract, but um, I view certain relationships as needing contracts and others are more casual, but I guess they were kind of considering a longer term relationship. I didn't really read the second book because I didn't like it, but um, the first book kind of ends with her like really signing the contract, and so I don't really know what was all involved in the contract, I guess, um, and whether she was going to be moving in with him or what not, but I guess no, it was, if you want to live a lifestyle, then yes, you should get a yeah. contract. If it's seeming, then, I mean, at your discretion, and if you really feel like you don't know the person as well as you need to in order to trust them, I mean, but if you're going to live a lifestyle, you really should, especially if you're going to be doing like a slave um, lifestyle, which is something we'll talk about. That's something that definitely needs to be contracted. Yeah. Let's see, what do you think? Oh, 
Go ahead, Emily. Um, my personal experience, and we can talk about this later when it comes up to the abuse, every scene needs to be contracted. Every scene. Mm -hmm. Because it is, it is illegal. It needs to be discussed you, for certain. But, yeah, um, it, sure if you don't have... A formal contract is needed. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess that's the thing. If you have people there and you have the buddy system going on, all those things, then, then you can be a little more loose with that. Which is why a protector comes in handy. Yeah. Yeah, but if there's anything that you're ever going to do in private without somebody there, make sure it is contracted, it is written out, because that's not might not stop the act from happening, but when it comes to getting, getting, getting justice, yeah. you have that piece of paper. You sign that piece of paper, and there might be a fight, but they can't say just because you let somebody tie you up means that you wanted somebody to penetrate you or any, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a very, very, I had a very traumatic experience in BDSM when I was younger. And I had, I had to learn the hard way, you know. And I don't, you know, especially with things like Fifty Shades of Grey, all these young women are like, and men, are like, oh, let's go do this. This sounds like fun. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you need to be more careful. <laughs> Right, and the law is really iffy on it right now. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that doesn't have any really legal precedent right now, and so there's a lot of issues with trying to um, get, you know, justice in, a, in a, a system where it doesn't really, it goes, well, you let them tie you down, so didn't you know the consequences? And it's like, no, that wasn't the agreement we made, and so... You know, I think a contract is a really good idea, and, and you make a lot of really good points. Leslie, you were going to say um, what the pros were, and I'm I'm interested to hear any pros because I, other than that, I really hated this book. You want to know the major pro? The yeah. one big pro is yeah. what we're doing right now. We are talking, talking about, about it. it. Yep. We um, are bringing it to the public, and we are having an honest sure. discussion on what. BDSM is and what abuse is and why they're not the same thing. Exactly. And it sounds like Matt's actually joined us. Matt? Welcome back. Matt, are you there? Thank Hey. I'm here, yes. Oh, fantastic. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay. Um, Matt, um, I have a, uh, a, I'm a distributor for Athena's Home Novelties and specializing in Fifty Shades Parties. And I've been in the lifestyle about roughly about 10 years and um, actually just coming back from a, uh, an event, a BDSM event over the weekend. So. Oh, fantastic. And what do you mean by 50 shades? Very familiar with the subject matter. And, and what do you mean by 50 shades parties? Um, 50 shades. They are, well, since the, the movie and especially the book coming out, uh, there are Fifty Shades themed parties that we do uh, mm -hmm. where the primary focus is in regards to um, blindfolds and simple handcuffs, uh, a flogger, uh, or a simple whip, a uh, riding crop, uh, some of the more tamer toys than what you would typically find in the BDSM scene, but some of the uh, implements used in the movie itself. Interesting. So, Very interesting. Well, either uh, by contact me directly through Facebook or I can give you the website address for my business page uh, or via cell phone. So uh, there's a variety of different ways that you can set a party. Um, I can talk to you, basically give you a a rundown of what the party entails, explaining essentially from uh, soup to nuts exactly what happens. Yeah. And um, it's a lot of fun because it gives people an experience to their own kind of uh, a mini Fifty Shades experience uh, where they at least get to, uh, if they've never been blindfolded or never been uh, handcuffed before, it's something that they can experience. Um, there's uh, also some yeah. what we call uh, sensory play, which is just when you when you take away one of your senses, the rest of your senses become heightened. So, for example, when you're blindfolded, 
and you have a feather that's that's run across your neck or across your breast, it is a much heightened sense than what you would experience otherwise. And so, uh, so it's just a matter of showing that. Yeah, uh, Leslie, what were you going to say? This is Emily. Um, sensory play oh. can also be if you have autophilia or um, other um, uh, actual like sounds. For me, I'm, I have actual autophilia where bass sounds can um, actually cause me to orgasm if I hear them in the right like order. Oh. So that can that can uh, yeah yeah. Um, huh. Anybody got a really deep voice? <laughs> But um, or people that have um touch, I don't know what that's called. Oh no, absolutely. Like, yeah, it's but I I just wanted to clarify that because as somebody who's in autophilia, people think that means I like music, and I'm like, no, I actually come from certain sounds. So yeah, I I think I've heard of like um like uh, tens units, so they'll oh, yes yeah, so they'll <laughs> produce electric currents that will. Yes that you'll feel um, in different parts of your body and those electrical pulses are very light and they're not dangerous. Um, so a lot of people think that they're dangerous. Um, they can be if you have like a heart condition or other things, but um, they're, they like, they kind of feel like getting a massage. And mm -hmm. they're, very, they're very interesting and um, a lot of people have been really getting into them. But what I really want to talk about is um, the different roles in the in the scene. Um, so there are um, dominant, submissive, and of course switch. Um, and there's master, slave, and um, there is also another category that I am blanking on right now. Um, but Leslie, you're really knowledgeable on these things. What, what are the different roles? Um, I think your explanation there was, I'm sorry, very simplistic. Um, you have your set of roles based in power exchange, which can range from a mild power exchange with a top or a bottom in a scene, mm -hmm. all the way to the master-slave relationship, which takes it to a total 24-7 power exchange. You also have variants of this power exchange relationship, which can include age play or, or pet play or root play, all sorts of different things. And whenever you add another aspect into the scene or the play or the dynamic, you change, you usually end up changing the name of the roles. But in very simplistically, it's who has the power and who doesn't have the power, who's giving up the power. And then when you add the other aspects, it becomes complicated and nuanced. Wow, that is a really good explanation. So and then when we talk about switches, and that's when you get fun. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I definitely want to talk about switches. Um, Emily, do you want to add anything to that um, power exchange? I don't think it's all, for me, it's not all necessarily about power exchange. Okay. Um it's, I mean, it can be in a sense, but then you also have um, pets. Um, it's not about power per se. Well, I mean, in a sense it is, or brats. Brats, everybody says are submissive. No, we are not submissive. No, we not. are the fucking boss. <laughs> we get our way <laughs> the way we want it. I'm, uh, and... Um, no, I, I, that is one of my biggest pet peeves, when people confuse a brat with a submissive. You can be a submissive brat, but you, d d no, it is not the same. So th there's also those. There's baby girls, there are baby boys, there are um, baby w in-betweens, there are daddies, there are mommies, there are, um, some roles are just as caregivers. That really isn't necessarily a power exchange to me as a energy exchange. Um, okay. Right. I, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. That's a very good distinction there. I was just including that energy exchange in with the power exchange. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it, it is kind of... I think it's a nuanced difference. Yeah. Um, there's, gosh, there's so many different 
I mean, I guess in any relationship, even outside of BDSM, there's always topping and bottoming. Um, there is that it's not ever 50-50. We all know this. There is give and take. There is take and give. There is days where you put everything in. There's days that your partners put everything in. It's, um, and especially when it, I think for when it comes to daddy, baby relationships or mommy baby relationships or I don't even like using the term baby because I'm I'm not into like that's one of the things I'm not into but I do have a daddy um, is uh, it's more I don't I, I it is top and bottom but it's not always the you know what I mean there's days where I mean, the brat thing you know there's days where I get what I want when I want it but then there's days that I give and I'm it's, so it's it's very it's all kind of blurry there are set you know master slave dominant submissive but even as a submissive if you're negotiating what you want and how you're getting it you are topping there so there is there it's very blurry <laughs> yeah that's, that's where the the fun comes in with the switching and I want to make the clarification that these power rolls are not concrete they are for a very particular moment yeah, they flow yeah definitely have a flow to them and in my research they have a lot of flow and there's a lot of give and take in the whole thing so yeah why don't you go over the switch because I think it's really the most relevant role Lauren, I was going to add one detail in regards to the daddy play. Yes, please. If I may. Yes, um, please. The, the, the daddy role oftentimes will come across also as not just being a, a dominant type of personality, but also a, um, like a, the type of guidance that a conventional father would have uh, for someone that, you know, maybe... They are, I'm hesitant to use the term life coach, but basically someone to just give sound advice to someone on maybe a day-to-day -day basis or yeah. to check in with them almost like a caregiver. Right. And uh, so it really kind of goes one step further than, than a, just a typical power exchange type of relationship. Oh. Yeah. That's, that's really, that's really. Can I add something to that? Yes, please. I think that, this caregiver aspect, this lifestyle doming, um, there's actually a difference between that. The caregiver is the affection and the lifestyle is um, unaffectionate, but it does basically the same thing. I think that is a form of power play, but it's power play without the sadomasochism part. It's power play where yeah. I know what's best for you. I'm trying to help you, but I'm still the one who knows how to do it, and that's why I'm helping you. Yeah, it sounds so that So it's very clearly powerful. Yeah, it sounds that way when you describe it. Um, I saw it as a power role when I first looked into it as well. Um, but it's not... A lot of people think that power role means that somebody is, you know, holding the whip. But it can also mean that, you know, somebody's in charge. And the daddy is always in charge. Um that in charge, mommy's in charge, lifestyle doms are in charge. Right, exactly. But we're not out to harm, we're out to help. Right, and that's the same thing right. in every relationship, is is somebody wants something, and, and the other person wants something, and it's this mutual exchange, and so that's really the point in the whole thing, and why I thought it was so relevant to um, talk about, because libertarians are so deeply into their you know, mutually beneficial exchanges and um, their free trade. And this is just another free trade relationship. I mean, it's two parties or more if, you know, you, you're up for it, exchanging and everybody's getting what they want or they wouldn't be part of this relationship. And so I think that's, a, this is a good place to make that point. Does anybody want to add to that point? No? I completely agree. Yeah, I, mean, I, I see the objectivism and the libertarian values in BDSM. Yeah, oh, very much. Cool. You're, you're taking self ownership for what you. Um, I think that's the biggest thing in my biggest peeve in BDSM. One of my biggest peeves 
is the lack of self-ownership. Um, as a girl, I label myself as girl because I am not a baby. I'm not into little play, but I do have a daddy. Um, as a pet, as a masochist, as somebody whose rules are are quite often bottomed, I I cannot take ownership for the assholery things that have been done to me because it was it was it. It wasn't I, what you agreed to. Right? It wasn't what I agreed to. But what I quite often come across, especially people that lab them, label themselves as brats or pets or not quite wanting to use the submissive term, but those kind of... And, and even with some submissives. And then you have the Mr. Domly Doms that do the same thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we've all come across those. Um, where you pushed me to do it. I'm misbehaving because you pushed me to do it. I, um, oh, you're not giving me exactly what I want when I want it, and especially as a brat or a, you know, submissive, when we come to, and not taking that self-ownership and saying, I, I don't do, I personally do not play well with those kind of people. I know some people enjoy that. That is their kink. That's great for them. I, I personally don't because I'm just like, grow the fuck up. We are in a very grown-up situation where you, even as a little, have to watch out for yourself because we don't know, you know. A lot of people don't realize that even in the little daddy exchanges, there are, like, there are things that the little does for daddy and, like, uh -huh. the little, yeah. like, makes pictures for daddy and does other things and, you know, it's, um, it's something that is very, uh, mutually beneficial and, and the daddy wouldn't, or mommy, wouldn't continue to be, play that role if the relationship wasn't mutually beneficial, if it wasn't enjoyable. Because this is something people take on in their personal life and especially when you have a daddy or mommy and a little situation, you, it's a very um, a very committed relationship. It's very difficult at times, and so um, you know, especially when they're really, really, really young. And so um, it's very interesting. And I really urge my audience to take a look into um, different uh, kinks because they range. I mean, a lot of people think that BDSM is just, um, and I think you know, it's a bad word for the community. Um, because it's, you know, it doesn't cover all the things that people are into. Like, there's certainly no feet in BDSM, and there's certainly no, um, I mean, there's no sapiosexual in that definition either. And Because the S does not stand for sapiosexual. Um, it should. It totally should. should. At, least for, at least for some of us. Um, yeah, and I love so, how we said that at the same time. And, and, <laughs> Sapiosexual, uh, to define for my audience, is um, liking somebody who is um, intelligent and being attracted to intelligence. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, you like intelligent people, and sometimes you're just really attracted to the knowledge. I mean, like, the knowledge just really is arousing for people. And it is. Have, have you ever sat and watched, like, a really, really good show about history or science, and you're like, yeah, I totally need to, like, take care of this. I don't no. know if I'm the only one. I no, and I and, nerds. I, nerds no. do it best. No. I'm gonna disclose. I went on a date last night, and my foreplay was three hours of philosophical debate. Oh, there you go. Ex, <laughs> with an ex monk. No, I I actually re I was discussing about I'm I'm in, I'm currently separated from two of my partners um, distance-wise because I moved and I'm with another partner and I cannot orgasm with a partner unless I have deep, deep intellectual connection with that person. And it doesn't, and then when I use intellectual connection, I don't necessarily mean smarts, but phil philosophy and religion and all those kind of things. Like, I never had an orgasm until I was 25. And it was one of my current partners, and because I never had that, I have never, you know, got to have that deep intellectual, you know, and I, I, I think there is that 
missing a lot of times and people are like why can't I enjoy my and you know it's just such a wonderful thing to be able to talk for hours and then yeah. That's actually another aspect that I would like to cover, um, and and we'll start with Matt if he's available. Um, sure, absolutely. I, I'm really interested to know there is a difference. There are people who um, can't ha, can't reach climax without an element, and then there are people that it just kind of adds to it. And what is the difference? And is there a word for it? And what, what, how does how is that dealt with? Now? Well, basically, there's um, a, there's a, a couple of distinctions. Like, for example, um, there are people that can orgasm, um, just like can only orgasm from whether it be clitoral or vaginal penetration, uh, clitoral stimulation or vaginal penetration. There are uh, types of orgasms where a, a toy specifically has to be involved, that they can't orgasm without a toy. There's also the possibility of someone having to have a certain type of, of pain inflicted upon them to really appreciate the orgasm uh, fully. And because the, the pleasure and pain neurocenters of the brain are very, very close and they're linked together, and so you can actually have, it's entirely possible to even blur the lines between pleasure and pain. And so when someone has a, an orgasm and they, I, I know people, for example, that will orgasm uh, specifically from nipple play, where they're, they get so turned on and excited by their nipples getting pinched or that uh, they climax just from that. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, there's also there's uh, climaxes climaxes just uh, specifically from anal sex that uh -huh. I know people that can only climax from that. So uh, is there a word for people that um like Leslie? You, you're really well versed on words. I actually it's just pulled up my DSM in front of me while we were having this because we were talking sapiosexual, hey. Um, <laughs> <they're> <laughs> the DSM is being revised right now. The latest edition is actually much better for the BDSM community. But there is the medical definition of a fetish. And a fetish is, or a fetishist, is somebody who needs another element or is strongly helped by another element being added in to consenting sex. So somebody with a foot fetish is somebody who very strongly wants or needs a foot play aspect in their sex in order for it to be fulfilling and in order for them to climax. Now, the reason it's in the DSM is because sometimes this interferes with somebody's healthy sex life and that's when it becomes a disorder. But the term still applies for a healthy sex life. So a fetish is somebody who brings a specific aspect in and needs it for it. Now, the difference here between kink is kink we don't need the specific aspect in order to have a fulfilling sexual interaction, but we like it anyway. Interesting. And I, I that think that's a very think that I like makes sense, that. Right? That's super thorough. I mean, yeah, that's that's see that was what I was looking for because you know, I've met people that like they can't even get there if certain elements aren't available. And so Emily, uh, what do you what do you think of this? Is there a difference? Should there be a distinction? Yes, um, there needs to be a huge distinction between fetish and kink. Um there are um when it becomes a fetish to the point that you need it to reach orgasm, that is that is when it becomes a technical mental illness. Um, it's and it's it's an addiction. I don't want to use the term mental illness. I'm going to use the term addiction here. And the process of having an there are certain things that you can incorporate in your normal everyday feet. You know, if you have a feet fetish. And it's just the smell of feet. It's very easy to um, have a very normal 
I hate using the term normal, but a very um, consent is so important when it comes to sex that certain people's fetishes you can't really consent to. I mean, you can, but it, they're dangerous. Or not even that if it's just not your thing. And putting your partner in a place where they're doing things just to please you and not because it makes them happy is a very, a very unhealthy place to be. And so when you have an actual fetish, there are certain fetishes that are from birth wired into our brain. Feet fetishes, um, I'm pretty for sure my sound thing might be, I mean, because it's a very nerve-based, and then there's things that we develop over time. Right. Um, and it's very important to distinguish when people are like, oh, I'm... I'm kinky. I don't have any fetishes. I'm kinky. Uh, there's nothing other than... Oh, I, actually, yes, there is some, the one thing that I need to reach orgasm with a partner. I don't need it to just reach orgasm because I can myself get myself to orgasm without much problem. But I have to have... <laughs> well, I, I, we're being honest here. I just, um, <laughs> we're being honest here. <laughs> a very deep intellectual brain connection with that person. Um, but it's, I can still have a normal functioning sex life without having to, I mean, there are days where I, there's kids in my household, so there are times where it's, we have five minutes in the shower, and I can still enjoy that, you know, there's, once I have the relationship with the person, but it is, it is very important to distinguish between fetish and kink, because once it becomes an addiction, just like any addiction in your life, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Yeah. And it is very, and that's the problem, one big problem with the BDSM world is it's very lenient a lot of times with fetishes. Your kink is and, not my kink and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's not necessarily true because mm -hmm. there, are, there are fetishes that are dangerous to yeah. everybody involved that involve non-consent. Um, anything that involves non-consent, and I'm not talking consensual non-consent, I'm talking actual non-consent. Yeah, I, I um, actually wanted to touch on that real quick, um, and then I want to move forward to talk about our last topic, because I think it's the most important topic. But there is a very important thing that we need to bring up, and that is things like pedophilia and other fetishes um, that people have that are dangerous to pedophilia um, is now people pedophilia as the is other person a sexual orientation. It's, it's that, not, it, or it is. It is. It is now considered a sexual orientation in most countries. I don't know about the United States. Okay. But um, it is. Um, there are ways of it's still considered a paraphilia with the with the DSM. Right, and um, and what so, what what do you guys think of this? What what I mean, we are, we're all about, you know, the consenting adults are able to do what they please, but, you know, in, in the pedophilia fetish, you, you can't obviously practice that with two consenting people, right? I, or am I wrong here? Well, let's, this, this is where anarchy comes in and how our laws are so fucked up that you cannot chemically castrate yourself by choice. You can't do it. They will not give you the medicine to take to stop your urges. And pedophilia is one of those things that is a continu from all, everything that I have researched is something that is a continual urge. It's a driving force. This, it's, but it's the fact of how love is a driving force. And I hate using that because it sounds so disgusting mixed in together. But most pedophili pedophiliacs aren't looking to harm somebody else. They're not looking to abuse somebody else. This is what they are attracted to. Um, it's the same as bestiality. Uh, it's, it's not. That's another one. Yeah, bestiality is no. a non -cons is is a non consent fetish. I actually have an example. Cannot consent. What were you saying, Leslie? Go ahead. I have an example that's a little less extreme. Um, one of my partners has a feeding fetish. Um. He recognizes that this is not at all a healthy thing. Uh, what, I'm sorry, what is that? A feeding fetish? Yeah. He is very much aroused by weight gain in his partners. 
Okay. So much to the point where you'll go to a BBW body type and beyond. And it'll the more you gain weight, the more he's aroused. So he's going to keep feeding you. But he realizes that this isn't healthy, so he restricts himself from doing it. Okay, interesting. And and, and what do you think? Like, is, is that... I don't want to say is it fair, because, I mean, if one party's not consenting, then you can't practice your fetish in a but beneficial is, way. But, you know, I try to let my free fraud fly, so... I don't know if you guys remember a while back in the news, there was somebody who had a sex doll that was, it was a sex doll that was a child, and they got prison time over that. Mm -hmm. They were trying to release their fetish in the most sane, consent way possible, and they were punished for that. That is the world that we live in, that it's so misunderstood and so understudied because it is a very, the victimization of children is always wrong. But there are people that try to to divert themselves and are being punished for it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't even write erotic stories in order to get these urges out without mm -hmm. risking jail time. Yeah, yeah, right. it is. You know, I mean, that's the whole thing about, I mean, I, me being outed on a public site um, into a group setting, I really didn't care because I'm sharing my stuff right now here with everybody. But right. there are people who use these things to talk about their fetishes. You know, I mean, nobody wants to know that their uncle wants to fuck a goat. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, oh, I mean, oh, and that just <laughs> happened, and I'm pretty sure that's the title of my show now. Um, so, um, last question. I know that we want to keep talking about this, but it's really important that we cover this last topic. And uh, this is, I want everybody to try and say as much as they possibly can in the next 10 minutes about this. What is the difference between BDSM and abuse? Emily, do you want to say something, or do you want Leslie to go first? Um, the difference, be the simple, basic difference between BDSM and abuse is consent. Right there, okay. that is the difference. If I tell my partner to hit me, I am consenting to them hitting me. If they hit me outside of that, that is abuse. Um, plain and simple, consent, that is the difference. Okay. And Leslie, what do you think? We need to make sure that the people and partners that we're interacting with in every scene are rationally capable of consenting. Oh, that yeah, scene. that's a good point, too. Um, yeah. There have been points in my life where I've consented to things that I probably should never have consented to, but I did. Yeah. And mm -hmm. my yeah. partners were not as attentive to the situation to notice that I wasn't in the right state of mind. And I think that this is an important nuance to the BDSM versus abuse that gets overlooked by us very strict, dogmatic, anarchist, objectivist, libertarians who are like, consent is law. But we have to make sure that we can consent. We have to be a rational adult in order to consent. Yeah, that's what I was saying, saying earlier. Let's be a grown-up here. Like, even yeah, as yeah. a little, you still have to be consenting to these things and yeah, to be able to make those choices. That very much resonated with me, and that's the importance of the safe word. Oh, is yes, safety e words. So important. And when we were talking about the power exchange, well, yeah, the bottom loses power, but... In the end, the bottom has the ultimate power. Because oh, they can save oh, yeah. They can stay red. We can save for Yep. So, well, we can say pineapple. Yep. Or whatever. <laughs> you agree to I that's very <laughs> important. That's a big... Mango. What? Pineapple, 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 pineapple. <laughs> Mango. <laughs> I don't think I got that one, but um, it's, it's a very I mean, important we can make aspect. A smoothie. It's a very important aspect of the BDSM lifestyle is um, 
that there are safe words and there are ways because you know no uh, no is used for consensual non-consent um, and it doesn't actually mean no. Um, so Matt, what is your take on this? The difference between BDSM and abuse. Basically, it's a difference in uh, consent and communication. If you have consenting person and you have communication of what the intent is, then you can mitigate any kind of abuse as long as both people are on the same page. Mm -hmm. The breakdown happens and where abuse happens is where one party is either not communicating or not fulfilling and following the consent and that's where the abuse happens because if if one person is consenting for something to be done and then the other person either exceeds their limits or goes beyond that, that's where the abuse begins. But it's where that consent is, you know, if you consent to getting um, spanked and that person takes it to the extreme and ends up using a paddle versus an open hand and you end up getting seriously hurt from that, then that's abuse. So, but it all comes down to really that, that communication and having a clear lines of communication in place and basically just making sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, you know, consenting to what you want to happen and having both sides agreeing to doing that. Yeah, that's a that's a good way of putting it. So, but for me, it's it's all just a matter of consent and communication. Okay, well, I like it. Um, so, ladies, uh, we are down to the last five minutes of our show, and ladies and gentlemen, um, and uh, that reminds me of a Louis C.K. joke. Oh my gosh. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I um, wanted to give you guys the opportunity to tell people where they can find you. Um, so why don't we start with our first guest, Leslie? Well, you guys can find me on Facebook as Leslie Ann Peterson, and you can find me on FetLife as Lady Lana Gannett. I will give Lauren the link to find me on FetLife if you would like it. Very cool. Emily, where can they find you? Um, I, well, I mean, I'm linked already to Facebook stuff, um, so obviously you can find me on Facebook. Um, you can find me on Twitter as, and hold on a second, I am making sure I am giving the right information here. Am I here to kitty cat? Yeah. Um, you can also like find me. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's like, I want to join into the kinky talk. Um, you can <laughs> Uh, you can find me on FetLife. My link is on the I have here. Um, and um, <laughs> I feel kind of funny giving out all this information, but I am a uh, pumpkin on FetLife with two underscores on each side. Um, mostly Facebook and FetLife and the pumpkin queen on uh, Twitter or at Fruit Loops with two O's instead of, well, two zeros instead of O's. <laughs> Interesting. Cool. And um, Matt, where can they find more about you? Uh, I can be reached on Facebook under Athena's by Matt Gould. Uh, last name is spelled G-O-U-L-D. And also I'm on FetLife under the screen name, uh, the number is 1-2, and then L I C K lick A L L all night. One two lick all night. <laughs> and I'm on probably both about equally amount. Oh, very cool. All right. I'm not well, gonna I'm go into detail. I noticed that we all have that we are primal and well, okay, not all of us, but most of us here are primal. Huh. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, um, I think that that about does it for this episode. And uh, this was definitely the most racy episode I have ever done. 
So um, I think I counted the word orgasm at least like 12 times. And we're, <laughs> and we're, orgasm, and orgasm, we're orgasm. definitely in the show. And um, fuck a goat was probably my favorite part. I have, well, I, mean... um, I have to go deal with my demon cat. So I will talk to you all later. And remember, knowledge is not for all men, but for those who seek it so truly. Keep seeking.